Well, praise God. This morning, as I prepare to bring the message, if you would turn in your Bibles or smartphones, devices, it's going to be Mark 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Mark 11, 1 through 11. And I didn't plan that. <laughs> but Mark 11, 1 through 11. Thank you, Lord. It's Palm Sunday. Amen. Palm Sunday. As some would refer to today as the beginning of Holy Week, as we're starting up with Palm Sunday and, and moving into uh, all the events that transpired at the crucifixion, the death and burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And this is the week for Christians that is probably the most significant, other than Christmas, right? Yep. Christmas being you know, the birth of our Savior, which was a tremendous holiday and still is. Um, Resurrection Sunday is the most significant. It was in his death, in his burial, that Jesus descended, it says, into the lower regions of the earth. He disarmed principalities. And he made a public mockery of the devil and all of his hosts. And it says that he stripped them of the keys of death and hell. Amen. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father, Amen. where he is seated to this day. Amen. Amen. As King of kings and as Lord of lords for all eternity. And his kingdom draws near today as it does every Sunday. But his kingdom draws near every time that you stir yourself up and walk out to, under the streets or go to your job or go to the store. You can gladly and, and you can proclaim boldly that the kingdom draws near to wherever you go because you are a carrier of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen? If you've been born again and filled with the Spirit, then you carry the kingdom wherever you go. And this is the gospel. This is the good news that in Christ we all people can be saved also. That he died for everyone. Amen? Amen. So we're going to take a look at the story. I've been so geared up. I told uh, my wife that I'm going to do a a short message, and whenever I say that, <laughs> it's 55 minutes, but I am really looking at the clock because I know we have a, an awesome service tonight, and there's some details and some things that we're working out with a lot of you and everyone who's serving, everybody that's playing a role, and it's going to be powerful tonight. And we got doubly blessed because not only is our pastor, Dr. Barkley, here, um, he ended up coming with a granddaughter, Libby, and he has his wife, Mrs. B., with them, which we did not know she was coming. And so we have her too, and she'll probably greet us. And she's a pistol, a fireball. Um, you'll, yeah, you'll like her. So we're doubly blessed. And I'm telling you, if you were thinking that this morning was your only service today uh, and you weren't planning on coming tonight, I want you to rethink that. I know some of you have to be gone. I've already talked to some of you. You're leaving. But if you're here, don't miss tonight. This church worked very hard at saving some money so we could bring them in. And our goal is to have pastor here once a year. Now, I don't know, we didn't do a big, a big hoopla this year, but our, is it our nine-year anniversary? Well, you, you, you get hung up on the five years that we've been here. Five years that we changed our name, Ever Present Church. But we've been pastoring for nine years. But So it's a five-year, seven-year, nine-year thing. I don't know which one it is. But it, our anniversary was March 7th, 13th. 13th. So we just passed a, a milestone. And so our goal will be to have pastor here uh, probably for our anniversary every year and, or at least right around there and get him to stir us up. Amen. So are you there? Yes. Are you in Mark? Mark 11111. All right, let's take a look at this together. It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, if that's how you say it, I'm not sure. And Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it. And if any of anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And doing this, say, Oh, I already read that, sorry. The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside of the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosening the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let them go. Isn't that amazing? 
that, you know, the Lord actually exercised the force, like from Star Wars. <laughs> you remember when uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi would say things, he's like, you're going to do this, and the people would be like, I'm going to do this. Or the Lord's like, just tell them that the Lord has need of it, and they'll let it go. And there was a couple times in the Bible that we read uh, that, that the Lord said to an, on another occasion at the Last Supper, say that, you know, we have need of the room, I have need of the upper room, and he let them have the upper room. He's awesome. And so they let him go. Now, then they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, which means praise the Lord. And when Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple, excuse me, and Jesus went, but when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This morning, as we're gearing up for Resurrection Sunday next week, this is Palm Sunday, and so I wanted to take a look at what, what that entails and what that meant, excuse me. Thank God for the water shelf. I have a, uh, a new medication, apparently, that likes to dry my mouth out, so say a prayer for me. <laughs> One of the most overlooked parts of this story, in my opinion, is the donkey. And this morning, because I, if you are human like me, uh, first and foremost, we need to try to relate almost anything that we read in the Bible. We need to look into that story, look into that parable, look into that scripture, and try to see ourselves and fit ourselves into that story. And so this morning, I want you to look into this story and know it's not you riding on a donkey. No, you're not the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to think that maybe look at the donkey and compare yourself to it. Has anyone ever felt like an ass in their life? <laughs> no, I didn't cuss in church. He, got, he was on an ass. Well, donkeys, this morning, we're going we're gonna to kind of focus on that. And what a donkey represents really is a symbol of service. And we know that Jesus, our Lord, came and he was a servant to all. All that he did, he did for everyone else. He laid down his life and he took up his cross. And he said to us that unless we take up our cross, that we are not even worthy of the kingdom. And so the donkey himself is not only a symbol of, of service, but suffering, peace, and humility. The donkey is known as a beast of burden. A lot of times we know, as we read about stories and different things, they would put supplies, like if they're going mining or down into like the Grand Canyon, they would put all their supplies and tents and whatever on the donkey, right? And so the donkey's job was to carry things and to move things for them. And so he was a beast of burden. We, too, need to be humble like this donkey in hope of being used of God to carry Christ and the good news into any town into any place or into any situation. And it, what was the name of that movie that was the animals? Was it the star or star was born? Anyone ever seen that? A star? It's a, it's a story about Christ and, and his, you know, e the Easter story, the resurrection story, but it's told from, the, from the, uh, the place of the animals. And so it was the donkey or the colt who was kind of honored that Christ, you know, rode on his back. And they were like, wow, how honored are you that you would be able to carry the Lord of glory, you know, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And so we, too, want to be humble servants of the Lord. And honestly, my whole life is about asking the Lord to use me. Do we pray that all the time? God, use us. Lord, humble us. Lord, we want you to... To, to make our lives a life of servanthood so that we could bring honor, that we can bring glory into your name. And so as we look at this story uh, in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, you don't need to turn there, but it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I, for one, have lived plenty of years in my life in a prideful state. I have lived plenty of years in a place where I thought that I was something special. I thought that I had talents or gifts to offer the world. You know, maybe I had gifts or talents to offer God. And we can fall into the trap of pride. 
But really all of those things came from God. And he gave them to you so that you could lay your life down, as we just heard, and take up your cross. What does the cross represent? You heard it said here before. The cross represented to Christ a death in the natural and a life in the spirit. So when he took up his cross, he died to everything natural, everything in this world, and he literally was crucified and nailed it to the cross. But it represented a death and a resurrection into newness of life. And so when he's telling us to take up our cross daily, he's asking you to die to the lust and to the passions and to the things that war against you and to walk after him in the spirit. Amen. And so we are all called to be humble servants of the King of Kings and of the Lord of Lords. We don't want to be a person of pride. And although we maybe have gifts and we have talents and we have a lot to offer God or the kingdom or this world, always remembering where they came from because they originated with God, they're here for God, and they're going to end with God. Amen? Because you are a servant of the Most High King. And everything that we do should be to bring him glory and to bring fame to his name. Hallelujah. This is not a call to fame and fortune or the spotlight, but rather a lowly position that lifts up and exalts what it's carrying. In this case, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. But like the donkey, we too are, we too are often tied up, aren't we? Like the donkey, remember, he was tied up in the town. And this is a colt or a fowl of a donkey, one that had never been ridden. How many know that horses have to be broken? You can't ride a horse until it's broken. And so we ask the question, what about a donkey? And they too have to be broken. But this is one that had never been ridden. It, wasn't, it was young. He was, I guess you could say, a virgin when it comes to being used by anyone to put things on or to, to ride them. And so Jesus called this donkey. But he was tied. And he said, loose the donkey. And bring them to me. And too often we are hung up and we're caught up on things of this life and caught up in the things of this world. We oftentimes are also tied to things, aren't we? And this morning as we reflect on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, as we're gearing up and going towards resurrection, I want you to know that today the Lord is calling you. And today the Lord is saying, be loosed and be untied from the things that hold you. We are entering into a new time. I believe we're entering into a season that Jesus is about to visit us. I've said this probably 50 times in my preaching career. And there are moments of time or kairos moments the Bible talks about that are times when the heavens open and times of refreshing come. Jesus coming into Jerusalem was not just fulfillment of prophecy, but it was it was a time when the kingdom of heaven drew near to the earth and like I would say like the window between heaven and earth was completely flung open. It was very tangible. The Lord of glory was walking with us. And then we have moments of refreshing and revival that have happened over the years at different and various times and we are coming upon another time of refreshing and another time of revival. We are right here now at the door and I believe it's about to be thrust open. That even all that's happening with, with visitations here to Batavia by various people, our pastor coming tonight, God's timing is precise, it's accurate, and nothing is ever by accident. He knows exactly what he's doing and he knows why he's doing it. And it's our firm belief that the well of revival that we have been trying to pry the cap off of for many, many years, and it started years ago. In 1916, quick history, watch my clock. Praise the Lord. But a quick history, there was a revival in this city that five area churches, some of the only, <laughs> that's funny, some of the only churches in town, I don't know how many there were exactly at this time, but 1916, five of the area churches came together and they did a revival where they closed their doors down and they all came under one roof in the park over here. The only one left to this day is the First Baptist Church on Main Street. Thank you. Water me, Lord. Water me. And they held services for five weeks in which 1,500 people gave their hearts to the Lord. Amen. When we were a, a new church in the YMCA, our, our oversight at that time, uh, Prophet Russ Jeffries, he uh, prophesied a word over us and said that there was a revival that happened in this city. 
And when you discover it, he said, then you would uncap the Ancient of Days. And so we feverishly went to work and we got the, with the historians and we started looking to see what happened. And that's what we discovered. And so for the last five years, we held a couple big events where we brought elevation worship to this. They were in the park, in the very park where they held that revival. We held one called the Great Tabernacle. It was a celebration of that 100 years later. And after that happened, we held two years of that. It was a ton of work. We had 30 churches that came together in ministries, and we all worked hard. There was some folks that came to me and said, that was a waste of time. What was that all about? Now, in the natural, I, I spoke that night, and in that crowd, as I shared a message to the gospel, and hands went up, tears, people were crying. I mean, it was over, well over 100 people gave their hearts to the Lord. And so in the natural, you could say, wow, it wasn't in vain. You know, everyone always says if one person turns from their wicked ways, then it was worth it. Well, this was a lot of work. Like, it took a year to plan, and it was a lot of money, but not that that matters. But what was it all about? Well, I'll tell you what it was all about. Those nights weren't just nights where we were looking for something to happen in an instant, but we were digging, we were plowing, and we were uncapping something. An ancient of days, or the ancient well of revival has been capped. And we started to unpry it. We began to dig at it. And that night as we worshipped in the park and the, and the sounds and the cries of those songs went out over the city. And believe me, they went out over the city because lots of complaints about how loud it was. <laughs> we weren't just singing songs and coming together to kumbaya. But in the spirit realm, we were letting the principalities and the powers and rulers know that their time has come to an end, that they have been evicted by the King of Kings and by the Lord of Lords. And since that time, we have experienced great resistance to the things that God wants to do. Even up to this moment, right now in time, in this day, I have listened and talked to some of you, and you're like, wow, there has been such a resistance. The enemy is so mad because there's something about to break loose. And he knows it too. And so God's timing is perfect. We're not just encroaching on another Resurrection Sunday. We're not just coming up on a holiday that we annually celebrate, which we are. But in the spirit realm, I know that when Dr. Barclay comes to this area, he's bringing an apostolic mantle with him. Amen. And when you're up against some things, now listen, I understand spiritual warfare, and I understand that every one of us has authority in the name of Jesus. I understand that some demons only come out by prayer and fasting. I know what the scripture says. I understand that we've held prayer meetings and worship services and we've been believing. But there are, at times, rulers, principalities, powers, and rulers. These are demonic forces. These are ones that are governmentally put in places geographically to reign and rule over regions. They don't move easy. Okay? And sometimes you can be banging your head against the wall trying to get them to move. But, but wait, Pastor, Jesus is king of kings. Can't he just speak a word? Sure. But he likes to do things the way he likes to do things. And he also has a government of order. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. And I don't believe we've had great evangelists in this area. We've got some good pastors, prophets. I don't believe that I have seen since... 19, when did we move here? 1999? 2000. I don't, and personally have not seen a true, there's not many of them out there, but a true apostle or man or woman that walks in an apostolic anointing. Well, we have one coming tonight. Amen. <laughs> this is a man of God who's been ministering for over 45 years. Uh, you will know when you're here tonight. You'll, you'll, you'll feel it. You'll see it. You'll sense it. And you'll understand. But he, he doesn't know why he's coming here, probably. I don't know. Maybe he does. <laughs> we, maybe we should clue him in. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, he's had more opposition in this flight. Actually, Rick, the guy that does all the planning and stuff in the flights, last night he said, in my history of working with him, I have never seen as much opposition as we have this, this weekend because he's in different. He's in another church this morning preaching two services, coming to our church, going to another one tomorrow. And they've had to change things. And the president flew into where he is right now. So they had to move their airplane. You might know this. Uh, they weren't going to be able to fly out of there because the president landed. You know, they pretty much closed down or something, like wherever it was. They had to move their airplane almost two hours away. So when they leave church this afternoon, they've got to drive two hours to get to the airplane. So that's going to hold them up. But they're going to be here, nonetheless. Yeah, one amen. How about a couple? Amen. 
So there's a point and a purpose to everything under heaven. And what's happening tonight is going to be good. It's going to be amazing. Whether we see anything in the natural tonight or not, I know that spiritually that God is up to something. I know that spiritually God is uncapping something. And I know that we're about to walk into something that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It's going to blow our socks off and our minds. Hallelujah. Amen. Now that was a little side note. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But like this donkey, back to the donkey. Anyone here remember we were preaching about a donkey? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like the donkey, we, we tend to get bound up sometimes. We tend to get tied up by things. Um, some of us are bound up by guilt or anxiety, concern. Some of us are tied down with the need to forgive, but we cannot bring ourselves to do it. Others might be tied down with obsessions or chemical dependency, depression, mental disorders, physical ailments. We may be tied down to our smartphones, our tablets, our computers, our televisions, devices in general. Some of us are just tied down by a busy schedule. Lord, I just don't have time. I've got so much going on. You know, my life is busy, Lord, don't you know? But this morning, as we focus on this cult, this donkey, who the Lord sent some people to grab, he was tied, and he said, loose him. This donkey, this, this cult of a fowl, this horse, he, his destiny, I don't know what happened to him after this. The, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this donkey after this. But his whole life may have been building for this very moment to be a carrier of Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, their King as he came into Jerusalem, as he rode on the back of this donkey. This might have been all that he was born to do. We don't know. And I know that the donkey knew who he was carrying because although they can't talk, unless the Lord enables them, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> that's been done too. I still believe that they would know when the presence of their creator is on their back. Amen. Amen. But nonetheless, some of us need to let go also. We need to not be afraid to show your faith, not be afraid to, to love and to, and, and to show peace and joy and the gospels, to share the gospel with others. As Christians, we need to be untied from that which weighs us down. It's so easy for us, so easy for us to get bound up with the affairs and the things of this life. And I'm asking you this morning that as we meditate on this, to just remember that who the Son sets free, John 8, 36, you are free indeed. Amen. We don't have to go back to the old way. We don't have to go back to those things that bound us. And God forbid we go back to things or to things that are new to us that would bind us up and cause us to be in bondage. But the Lord, as he loosed that donkey, he's loosing you today. This is the week, Holy Week, and Resurrection Sunday's coming. And he's loosing us for his service because he has plans for your life. It's so easy sometimes to look at the mundane and to look at the, the daily grind and the day in and the day out and say, God, what am I here for? What have you called me to do? Is this all it is, is working, going through the motions, going to church on Sunday? I beg to differ. Every one of us has a, a, a unique purpose and a plan that God has positioned you for. It's not an accident that every one of you, some of you guests, are here today. You're, it's not an accident that you're here. You're here to hear a word. You're here to praise God. You're here to prepare your heart before Him for the work and for the service that He has prepared for you. There is a destiny upon your life. Nothing is by happenstance. Nothing is by accident. The Lord loves and knows every one of us in detail, intimately. And the numbers of even our hair are numbered. I mean, that's intense. Now, a couple of uh, points from the donkey as we move along in the message. Number one, when he rode in on this donkey, Christ was claiming his rightful place as the prophesied Messiah. I see it. Zechariah wrote, uh, she's holding numbers up at me. Zechariah wrote, Behold, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. He is humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, on a fowl of an ass. Zechariah 9.9. 9. When Jesus came into Jerusalem that day, he was fulfilling a prophetic word that was spoken hundreds of years before by the prophet Zechariah. And when he was coming in that day, 
He was boldly declaring, yes, I am your king. I am the king of the Jews. And when they laid out their coats and when they laid out their palm branches, this is what they too were declaring. It's what they were decreeing that this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And I want to remind you of this, that on uh, this Sunday, Palm Sunday, as they welcomed their king into Jerusalem, not four days later, the same people were shouting, Crucify him! Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm branches and their coats being laid out with a decree that this is our Messiah, this is our King. And four short days later, shouting out, crucify, crucify. What happened in four days? The same things that happened to us. When we get retied and bound back up by the affairs of this world. See, don't think for a second that you're above reproach. Don't think for a second that you're above temptation or trial. Don't you ever think for a second that you are standing, the Bible says, lest you fall. Because just like them, in one second, in one minute, we can go from Hosanna to crucify him. Now, we don't think we can, but even Peter himself denied the Lord, denied the Christ. And the Lord warned him that he wouldn't. He said, no, no, no way, Lord, not me. Don't you know I'm the water walker? I got your back, Lord. Until the moment came. You think, well, it's, I, I can handle this, this rated whatever movie. A couple of cuss words don't, don't harm me. I, I can, I'm, a big, I'm a grown man. I can handle this movie. I, I don't like nudity, but I can do cuss words and violence. It's okay. So you're screening some things, but you're allowing some stuff in. It's fine. Oh, I can handle all the you know, social media apps and all of the inundation of what's going on through your phone and your tablets. It's, it's no big deal. Listening to the wrong music, hanging out. Do so you think that you can hang with the wrong crowd? You think it's okay to hang with, with uh, une or be unequally yoked or married or be in a relationship with somebody who's not a believer? See, we can convince ourselves that we're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's Bible. But the Bible also says that bad company corrupts good morals. Wisest man ever lived, Solomon wrote Proverbs and I think, you know, what we read when he was giving us the advice that we should be very, very careful the things that we do, the things that we allow in, and the things that we partake in. Because we too can be rebound or bound to new things and go from Hosanna to crucify him in a matter of days or minutes or hours like they did. And so the solemn warning today is to go back like the donkey and to remind yourself of what is the call of my life? Why was I born? Well, what did you create me for, Lord? Yes, I've got gifts and yes, I have talents. But those things, when they're not submitted to the King of Kings and to the King of Glory, become nothing but a burden in his hands. But when they're submitted with a spirit of humility and you know that you have nothing outside of the plan, the will, and the purpose of Almighty God and by the power of the risen Lord and His Holy Spirit living and breathing on the inside, that all of your talents and gifts and all of the things that you know and the things that you don't know, they need to be surrendered and humbly laid before the King of Kings. Lord, forgive us for thinking that we can handle all of life's affairs, Lord. Forgive us, God, for thinking that we can do it all on our own, God. For thinking that we're greater than all of the temptations and the, the sin that so easily ensnares us, God. We're human, Lord, and we, we too often need to be reminded. And although you've loosed us, I pray, God, that we remain in the power of being loosed. Number two. Jesus rode on a donkey to symbolize peace. Why didn't Jesus ride on a war horse as he did in Revelations? All of Jerusalem and most of the Sadducees and Pharisees and those that believed that a Messiah was coming, that Yeshua was coming, they believed that he would put an end to all of the heartache and the pain and the misery. And they believed that he was going to set up an earthly kingdom. That he would reign and rule and that he would fight for them. 
And on the hour of his betrayal, even Peter to that moment, when the guards came to seize him, pulled his sword and cut the ear off of, a, of one of the soldiers. And Jesus said, put that thing away, man. Those that pull out the sword, they'll die by the sword. He didn't come for that. Peter was unaware of a true purpose and meaning of what Jesus came to do. And that was to come in humility and to lay his life down that he might take it up again. He came on a donkey because that was a symbolized, a symbolized peace. He didn't come for war then. But there's a day coming when Jesus will come back on a war horse. And the armies of the world will gather to fight him. And it says that he will defeat them with a word. Amen. A word. Don't you want to know what the word is? <laughs> All of the armies of the world gather at Armageddon to fight against Christ. And it says that he comes out of the clouds, defeats him with a word. Now he is the word, so maybe it's paraphrasing that he's just going to defeat him because he's the word. Nonetheless. In ancient Middle Eastern world, uh, leaders rode horses if they went to war, but donkeys if they came in peace. If they came in peace. Number three, emissaries sent donkeys overloaded with gifts to appease the wrath. This is a good one. To appease the wrath of an enemy, preventing bloodshed. And Jacob sent donkeys packed with treasures to avoid the wrath of his brother Esau. And Abigail brought donkeys packed with food to keep David from killing her family. And so emissaries sent donkeys overloaded with gifts to appease the wrath of an enemy. This donkey was holding the gift. The gift that would appease the wrath of Almighty God. The only gift, the only Savior, the only one born without sin that could be the perfect sacrifice, the perfect sacrificial lamb. The one who would lay down his life and appease the wrath of Almighty God once and forever and pour out his life as a drink offering and his blood for the remission of sins for you and for me. This donkey was carrying the ultimate, the ultimate gift of appeasement. Amen? Amen. Palm Sunday was and will always be the day that prophecy was fulfilled and the king came into Jerusalem. Not for war like so many wanted, but for peace. This is the day that Jesus entered their city, he entered their village, he entered their home, and he entered their hearts. Let's let this day be the day that Jesus enters our hearts if we've never met him, if we've never asked him to come into our hearts. Let this day be the day that he enters our homes once again, enters into our lifestyle once again, enters into our, our playtime, enters into all of our life whatever it may be, and all of the distractions and the things that we were tied to, let's be loosed this day. Let's allow the Lord to free us so that we can be free indeed to serve Him with the way that we were called to serve Him. Their dreams came to town that day, their fulfillment and answers to prayer, peace, health, and healing, joy, prosperity. They're all in all. Everything that they had need of rode into town to meet them on the back of this humble, lowly donkey. Palm Sunday, the day not only that the king rode in, but the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, our all in all. And Jesus cried over Jerusalem on how much he wanted to save them, but he knew the outcome of what was coming. Palm Sunday is an occasion when we can take a moment to ask ourselves, what is it that I need to be untied from and loosed from? What is it that I can praise and honor God with? What's holding me back from being a vessel of glory for the king, a carrier of his presence, a carrier of the Lord himself into every aspect of our lives, everywhere that we go? Let's let Palm Sunday free us to experience Holy Week in a way that does not hold us from truly singing aloud Hosanna and Hallelujah. Hosanna! And hallelujah on resurrection morning. Let us be untied as we share in Palm Sunday so that we may unite with the one who was tied on the cross as our Savior. The Lord paid the ultimate price. Laying down all that he had, all that he was. And as we approach 
Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. We may hear more of this throughout this week as you listen to other messages, as you're studying your, on your own in the Word. Maybe you'll have something on the radio, but I want to remind you of this as I close. To bring this whole story into perspective, Jesus laid down his life. They didn't take him. You might know the story when they came and they were in the Garden of Gethsemane and that was where Jesus was agonizing and his sweat had become like droplets of blood. And when they had come with their torches and clubs and spears and swords and, and they said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And it says that all the soldiers fell backwards onto the ground. And they got back up and he said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. But when he spoke it that first time, what he was saying was, I just want you to know that at his words, the power of God rests. And when they came to get him, he wanted them to know, you're not taking me by force. Because he said, I am he. And they all fell backwards just at his words. In the same word that he's going to use when he defeats the armies Amen. of the world. I'm laying my life down. You're not taking me by force. Peter cuts off the ear of the soldier and Jesus somehow miraculously super glues it back on. He's Amen. the Lord, right? Amen. And he looks at him and says, Don't you know I can call 12 legions of angels right now and put an end to the whole thing? Don't you know that I have the power, the authority and the rule to call 12 legions of angels? I don't have to go all the way. But I'm doing it because I love my Father and I love you. And I'm laying my life down. Yes. Yes. Jesus had all the power to call 12 legions of angels and destroy the whole earth. The Lord, God, gave him that. This is my will, son. And as he was praying in the garden, he said, God, take this cup from me. He knew what was coming. But nonetheless, not my will, Lord. Your will. A perfect sacrificial lamb, a life that we know is Jesus Christ. We know him as Lord. We have met him at the cross. We had died to our old self and we've been resurrected in newness of life. He is now my Lord, your Lord, if you've received him. Amen. And before we leave this morning and as we're getting ready to head out, and I want to ask you this morning, have you made Jesus your Lord? Because many people have made Jesus their teacher. Many people have made Jesus a good prophet. Many people have made the Bible just a good book of stories that men wrote. But they don't believe that it's the infallible word of God. They don't believe that the words that are actually in that book were sent by the Spirit of God and that men wrote that book inspired by the Holy Spirit. That it's not just a book, but it's a book that's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to separate spirit from soul and bone from marrow. Amen. It knows, it's, it, it discerns the intentions of the heart. And this morning, I'm asking you, have you ever made Jesus your Lord and your Savior? Have you ever asked him into your heart? Or is he just a good fairy tale or story that you've heard about or read about? When Jesus asked the apostles that, he asked them what men say they are, say that I am, and they told him. He said, but who do you say I am? Remember last week? Peter jumped up and said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. That measure of faith had come to his heart. The Lord poured out a, the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he could receive eternal life and salvation in Christ. This morning as we wrap this up, I ask that you would please just bow your hearts and your head right now. And in the silence, a lot of people are uncomfortable with silence. You know, I used to be as well because it leaves you to your own thoughts, right? It leaves you to ponder and question. And that's exactly what we're doing here this morning. In just a minute, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a prayer. 
And we do this often. And if you say this prayer, it's just a prayer. It may mean nothing. But if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe that He died for your sins, and that He was raised on the third day, the Bible says that you will be saved. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That if you believe in your heart, those things and confess with your mouth you will be saved and so as we ponder this morning I'm asking you listen this is a matter of life and death there's nobody looking around everybody's eyes are closed and every head is bowed this is a matter of life and death we have not a promise that we shall live tomorrow we could die as we walk out this door today you could be standing at the throne room of God looking at God in a matter of minutes or an hour. And he may ask you, did you not hear the word preached? Did you not hear the gospel? You sat in church. You heard the message. I'm not saying this to make you feel scared or condemn you. But faith is now. And there's no time like the present. And we don't have to wait for salvation. That salvation is here. The word of faith which we preach. It's in you. It's near you. It's in your heart. It's on your mouth. And I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. And I'm going to ask that every person here would pray with me. Typically known to the Christian as the salvation prayer or the sinner's prayer. And like I said earlier, it's only a prayer. A prayer only comes to life when you put your faith into it and you believe with all of your heart that what you're asking for is truth and what you're asking for you believe. I'm going to ask that you just repeat after me if everybody would. Lord Jesus Christ. We come before you as sinner. And I ask that you forgive me, Lord. I believe that you are Lord. And that you died for my sins. And rose again. I believe that you're seated at the right hand of God. And that you are Lord. And this day. I ask you to be my Lord, to be my God, my Savior. Pour out your Holy Spirit into my heart and into my life. Lead me, God, and guide me into all truth. And now I thank you for this great gift of eternal life. And I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that I know a lot of you are already saved and I ask you to say that prayer with me not to resave you. We don't need to be resaved, but to do it as a group so that those that are asking for the first time would feel comforted in their decision and their prayer. But all of the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner turns from their wicked ways and gives their heart to the Lord and changes. And what does that mean? Something happens on the inside. The old man has passed away. The old woman has passed away. And behold, you're a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And from this day forward, you go out and the Holy Spirit is with you and he's leading you and he's guiding you. And you have this closeness with, with Father again. Something that we lost at the fall. And Jesus redeemed it for us. Amen? So, if you said that prayer for the first time or you said it for the second time or maybe the third time, maybe you said that prayer but you meant it with your heart. If you said that prayer and you know that you were truly asking him to come into your heart today, I want you to come see me after service, after we dismiss. I have some stuff for you and I want to pray with you. And for the rest of us, if you can be here tonight, you do not want to miss Pastor Barkley tonight. 
Uh, this, this is quite an honor, um, not only to be connected and have our ministry under his ministry. You know, that's, that's a great covering to have over us. And the mantle and the anointing that he has, you know, trickles down into our lives because, uh, because of the alignment that we have with, with heaven in this way. But it's the first time now, we've known him for 30 plus years, but this is the first time that we've had him at this church. So this is even more exciting for that reason. And uh, I'm just saying, please don't miss. If you got to miss next Sunday to come tonight, just come tonight, okay? <laughs> I'll forgive you. I mean, I, I'm old school. We went to church twice on Sunday, twice in the week. Yeah. You couldn't get us out of church. And, and then they beat it into us. When we missed church, we felt terrible because we, you know, we were so routined into being there. What do you got, honey? Come yeah. on now. Real quick, I want to let you know, this is normally our building fund Sunday. Oh. But what we are asking is instead of doing the building fund, we would like to honor Dr. Barclay tonight, okay? So bring, see, this is where we're saying come to church tonight. <laughs> so bring your building fund offering tonight, and we're going to honor the man of God with it, okay? We're going to do that for him. Um, now, we'll have guests here tonight. We'll have a handful yep. of guest pastors that are coming. Uh, this is quite an honor for our little church to, to serve in the kingdom, right? And to be, uh, we, we got close to each other. It's hot. It's hot in here. These microphones are... <laughs> I think it's just us. This is the magnetic force of our love. But That's anyway, uh, I'll stop. Um, I'm going to sit down because I'm embarrassed. I'm blushing now. Now I'm going to. I'm already red, so it doesn't matter. Um, but this is quite an honor, you know, to, to be able to host. And, and I know Mary understands this a lot. She's a big fan of Kenneth Hagin, right? But Kenneth Hagin, all of pastors, pastors, his fathers in the faith, have gone on to be with the Lord. Kenneth Hagin was one of them. So what, that, what does that mean? It means that he had, he had five spiritual fathers that, that he spent time with and that spoke into his life. Kenneth Hagin, um, Lester Summerall, John Osteen. John Osteen, not Joel, but John, his father. And John was a fireball. Um, and I'm forgetting a couple of the others. Roy Hicks, Roy Hicks and there's one more. Anyway, um, and so the anointing that was in their lives is, is in his life. Does that make sense? And so he is kind of a modern-day Kenneth Hagin. And just to say that, you should understand that um, his schedule is so demanding. And this man pastors, and this sounds crazy, but he pastors 900 pastors. Just to give you a little scope of, you know, but yet has time to have a relationship with us when we text him and when we call him, which is impressive. I, I don't know how he does it, but God. Um, he just, just he started to tell us how he does it. He has a very tight schedule. He's an ex-marine dr drill sergeant, um, and so he's very runs a very tight ship with his own life. But nonetheless, this is going to be a tremendous blessing to host. And so we s saved money over the last so many months, and we have paid for all the expenses of hotels. There's going to be some food for the guests, uh, pastors after church. We've paid for that. The hotels, airfare, everything's paid for except for an honorarium. And so we're going to receive an offering tonight when everyone's here. And whatever we get, we're going to honor the man of God. Amen? It's common in church. But we've done good. You guys have done tremendous this church. In, this church and so we're really blessed to uh, be past. We're happy to be pastors here. <laughs> and uh, you guys have done well. So I just want to say thank you to our guests. There's a few of you scattered around. Welcome and thank you. We didn't, I don't know if we welcomed you. Um, we do have a, a booklet of stuff for you as well, if you didn't get one. And uh, so if you can make it, come back. I know you're busy. I know some of you have already talked to you. But we'll see you right back here tonight. Now, there's some quick meetings for uh, some of the prep for tonight. So if you can hang out, if you're part of the service, uh, do that. The rest of you, be blessed. Have an awesome Sunday. Have an awesome week. We'll see you right back here tonight, right? And then uh, we can get blessed again. Amen. We love you. God bless you.